Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is John Mintz. I'm the director of the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies. And uh, welcome here to talk about Brazil. Very important topic in one world for international relations, for international political economy, and for many other reasons. And I'm very pleased to be able to say that our speaker at this seminar is Dr. Sean Burgess. Uh, Sean is our new appointment at the ANU, great triumph, our first appointment in Latin American politics, and not only for the ANU, but actually the first appointment in Latin American politics anywhere in Australia ever. And so it's quite a uh, coup for us and I think represents something of our orientation in the ANU and some commitment on part of the university to invest some real resources in studying Latin America, as indeed it should have a very long time ago. Uh, but Sean's going to talk for about uh, 40 minutes, all thereabouts, and there'll be plenty of time for discussion after that and also for refreshments at the end and less formal discussion and so on. While Sean's speaking, I'll pass around, or Ben will pass around an email list. So many of you I know already have your names on the email list, so I don't bother to put them down again, but if you haven't, then by all means do, and you'll get notices about the many, many activities that we run. I added up how many seminars we've held last year and this so far, and it came to 36 public lectures or seminars and 33 film showings. <laughs> so there are a lot of things that you can get information about from our website and also from the email, the email list if you're you know, not there already. So without further ado, sure. Okay. Uh, thanks. thanks to John Mintz, uh, to John for the introduction. And I've got to say that uh, I'm delighted to finally be here at ANU. <laughs> it took a long time to get through the various immigration uh, hoops to get here. And uh, I was actually quite surprised to hear what you keep telling me, that I'm the first Latin American politics person to be hired. Um, given that I've spent much of the last seven or eight years talking about Brazilian hegemony in the Americas and one shape or form, it's kind of ironic that it's a Brazilian who takes that post and works with Portuguese and not with Spanish. Um, what I'm even more delighted to see here at ANU is the effort and the attention that's being put into Latin American studies, uh, to understanding what's going on in the hemisphere, in, in the Western hemisphere. It's kind of a lost opportunity, and it's nice to see that, that people are taking steps to try and take advantage of it. You know, there's a saying that's been popping up in the media quite a bit recently, um, and it's one that Brazilians have been saying for an awfully long time, for a couple of hundred years in the back. And it goes something like this. Brazil is the country of the future. And if there's any Brazilians in the room, they'll probably finish it with, and it always will be. Part of what's coming out of Brazil today is that maybe the future's arrived, but Futuro chegou. I mean, you, you do see this showing up in op-ed titles and in various, various uh, academic works. So what I'm planning to do today is not necessarily to talk so much about the internal changes in Brazil. I'm going to talk about Brazil's foreign policy, um, a bit about where it's come from, because this is something that a lot of people don't know about. So it's more like the institutional framework that, that caused it to arise, and some of the changes that have happened after the Cold War and where it's going now. So I'll give a little bit of a historical context, or more like an institutional historical context. Talk to Brazilian diplomats, and they'll talk to you about their patron saints, Jose Maria da Silva uh, Paranha Jr., Baron of Rio Branco. Very important man for Brazilian history. Brazil has borders with, let me get the number right, 12 countries in Latin America, in South America. It's 12 or 10, I keep saying. 10. Yeah. It's 12, yeah, it's 10. There's two that don't border, which is Ecuador and Chile, so it borders the other 10. It hasn't had to fight a, um, fight a war to settle any of those borders. They were all settled through process of negotiation, arbitration. Um, and the Baron of Rio Branco is central to doing this. He, he settled the uh, border with Bolivia, he settled the border with the French up in Guyana, um, and did this all through a series of negotiations and arbitration processes. And this, this forms a central plank in Brazil's um, foreign policy edifice. We discuss, we don't fight. Um, and it, it's stuck. Possibly more important is uh, what the Baron did for the institutional framework of making Brazilian foreign policy. And in 1902, there was all sorts of congressional and presidential conflict in Rio, which was the capital at the time. And there was a real sense that someone was needed to take control of the country's foreign policy. And there was bipartisan support for the idea that it should be the Baron, that he's the one who should do this. He's our great diplomatic figure, the one who understands the world. He can do the job right. He didn't want the job. Every job on that level in Rio had become politicized. And so he made a bargain. He said, if I'm going to take this job, the only way I will do this is if you let me set up a proper professional technocratic institution that can be run apart from the domestic political fray. Clearly, we'll take directive, but we're not going to get involved in the day-to-day -day domestic political squabbles. 
We're going to worry about the country's national interest and its projection outside the borders. So this is enormously important because he started up the idea of a professional, a professional core to the civil service in Brazil, and particularly in the foreign ministry. And even today, um, you notice it. You talk to Brazilian diplomats, and you talk to diplomats from pick another country, um, and there's a huge difference. To get into the foreign ministry right now, you write six three-hour long exams that take about a year to prepare for, and you get about three or 4,000 people apply for it. And last time I checked, it's gone up, but it was about 60 people get admitted to the Rio Branco Institute to train for a year to become a diplomat. It's very, very competitive, which involve, results in very qualified, very capable people um, who also have a very unique, clearly defined, consistent approach to how you look at the world. Um, one other important thing that uh, Rio Branco did was uh, he spent quite a bit of time in Europe um, and in the United States before coming back to Brazil to settle the borders. And being an observant, observant gentleman, he noticed that there was, there was a shift in power coming. He saw that Europe was declining in importance and the United States was rising. So he came up with this idea that we need to think about what kind of sphere of influence do we fit into. Do we worry about the European or do we want to go with the US? And for him, a big concern was how do we protect this vast country which has very little military capacity? So he used the Monroe Doctrine as an umbrella, basically making a bargain with the United States. We'll go along with you, we'll recognize the Western Hemisphere as your, your domain. If you leave us largely alone, and keep the Europeans out. Um, and this kind of thinking has sort of gone on for the last, up till about 2003, I would say. That, you know, what are you doing? Are you playing the Europeans off the Americans, the Americans off the Europeans? The central point being that the axis of importance is in the North Atlantic. That's where the world matters. That's where everything goes on that matters. And, and this is going to be a theme that will come out a little bit through the, uh, the talk here. So some of these things that uh, Rio Bronco set up have stood this test of time. Like I said, the diplomatic service, highly, highly professional. Um, Brazil has aspirations to, and has long had aspirations to be at global decision-making tables. They sat at the Treaty of Versailles. They were on the Executive Council of the League of Nations. Brazilians to this day are incensed that they didn't get a permanent seat on the Security Council when the UN was set up, which is the, the SOP that they received, the payoff that they received for their work in San Francisco, was they get to make the first speech at the UN every year. Um, you also have things that come back from the institutional setup that Rio Branco did. Itamaraty, the, the foreign ministry, it's named after the palace in Rio de Janeiro that used to hold, house the foreign ministry, and the palace in Brasilia, uh, the Oscar Niemeyer construction is named Itamaraty too. Um, that's still where foreign policy is made for the large part, but that's where people think it's made, that's where it should be made. They feel that we're the professionals, we're the ones who know, we're the ones who should have the last say on what goes on. So, what I'm arguing here, uh, and generally consistently seem to argue over and over, is that from the, the end of the Cold, War, uh, the Cold War, we see quite a few uh, changes in Brazilian foreign policy, and I would say, as I'm going to argue today, some big changes since uh, Lula came to power. The idea that things have to change after the Cold War is not particularly new, and if you go from the 92 to 95, you get a whole raft of uh, policy-oriented and academic-oriented publications by Brazilian diplomats about the new, strategic uh, the new strategic context. How do we deal with this? What do we, what do, we do? Um, the changes that needed to be made substantially were started by Fernando Collor de Bello when he pushed very hard to get Mercosur set up, the Southern Cone Trade Bloc, which, depending on who you talk to, is in various states of health at the moment, but includes Argentina, uh, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay as the main members, and if the Paraguayan Congress votes approval eventually, it could include Venezuela as well. Um, what Collor did is he started a process of liberalization of opening up the Brazilian economy, privatizing industries. Um, he pushed, again, Mercosur was pushed very hard for a couple of reasons. Um, partly, um, I think, post facto, you could say it's looking for opportunity. Where do we find opportunity? It's closed in the north, so we need to look in the south. Um, you also looked at uh, Mercosur as essentially just a straight place to, to develop the market so that Brazil had somewhere to grow. There was a political element to it. Democracy was a new thing in the southern cone, in South America, or a fragile thing in places. So Mercosur is a very important part of protecting, consolidating democracy, because we're of a club that would keep it together. But the prevailing analysis, and I think this is one that, that fits, is that one of the central problems that Brazil faced in the early 1990s, in fact, throughout the 1990s, was, was Brazil a serious country? 
right? I mean, today we talk only about sort of a little bit more than soccer and samba, or football and samba. But it was even worse back then. You talked about Brazil as your sort of poster child of an economic basket case. Um, one friend of mine who works extensively with Brazil talks about going in uh, between high school and university, and he was in Brazil for 12 months and experienced four different currencies in the same period. Um, it, was, it was a byword for economic disaster. For anything to progress in the country, this needed to be changed, and Mercosur was a big part of this. Um, it created economic options that weren't totally reliant on the North. It created a space where you could do some sort of import substitution industrialization and continue that model, but you could do it in a way where you didn't have the same political pressures to maintain the high tariff barriers. You could cut them because your partners were telling you you had to cut them. You pre-agreed to cut them. And again, it created a regional framework to vouchsafe democracy and essentially stability. Um, and this mattered. Uh, with 1996 in Paraguay, we have an attempted coup by the Menor Oviedo. Um, and really, without the pressure from Mercosur, that would have come off. Um, repeatedly, if you look at the Paraguayan case, it's Mercosur that stops the generals or different drug factions from trying to take over and, and run things on their own. So Calor sort of set the framework. He put a couple of blocks in place. And then we have Cardoso come on the scene. And Fernando Guiqui Cardoso, I think he's, you know, my, my feeling is that, um, and this is definitely not popular probably with the government at the moment, but my thinking is that Brazil got incredibly lucky by having this man as president when they did. You got a guy with enormous intellectual capacity, one of the best understandings of the problems of development, fluent in four languages, um, definitely a creature of the elite, um, so able to go to the halls of power in any country and discuss on an equal basis and present Brazil as something that's credible that will work. More importantly, he brought a vision of what he thought Brazil should do and where Brazil should go in a foreign policy context, and it didn't really jive with what the diplomats wanted to do. And he, he said, you know, right from the outset, he had a deliberate program of seeking leadership in South America. And he was crystal clear about this when he met with his, his counterparts, that Brazil should be leading this continent, and we should be leading you somewhere positive. But he could never say this. Because at the same time that Cardoso was trying to pursue this agenda, he had a couple of things he had to run into, he had to deal with. I mean, first of all, well, how can you stabilize a continent? How can you lead a, a continental landmass forward when you can barely afford to pay your own interest payments on your debt? So he had to get the fiscal house in order. Um, you had uh, cultural, historical reasons for not trusting each other. I mean, Argentina and Brazil relations are interesting. Possibly the best way to put it. Uh, not anything like as fractious as they were, but it, it wasn't all that long when Carlos was in office when you had a mutual nuclear arms race going on. And so you got this mentality that diplomats in Brazil will still bring out that we're a former Portuguese, we're a Portuguese speaking former monarchy in a land of Spanish speaking republics. Add to that that we're physically bigger than everybody else and economically bigger than everybody else. Why should anybody trust us? So you have to offer something, some way to trust. So one of the things that Cardoso did is he sort of let the diplomats run their way. He said, you know, we can't talk about leading because we're not willing to absorb the cost. So he did. Um, they talked about creating consensus. I love that phrase, creating consensus. Not generating consensus, reaching consensus. It's creating it. In other words, talking everybody else into the ground until they agree with what you want to do, uh, to, to summarize things massively. He sold an ideological package, uh, or not ideological, ideational is a better way, to, is what I mean. Um, created a very clear link between the idea of democracy and development. And if you go through his speeches, his statements, and the kind of policies that he pushed, the very clear message that comes out is that if you want to have a high value added economy that offers ample opportunity for everybody, you have to have the kind of freedoms you have in democracy. Because it is only in democracy that you allow, that you have the space for the public discussion, disagreement, dissent, and argument, and contestation that creates innovation. And that, that's very much the message that he pushed through. And that the state's role in this is not to make it happen, but to create the conditions for it to happen. Another thing that he pushed was uh, the articulation of South America as a separate space. Uh, Leslie Bethel, I haven't had a chance to read this yet because I just downloaded it this morning, but uh, Leslie Bethel at Doyen of the Studies of uh, Brazil uh, has just published an interesting looking article talking about the fact that Brazil is not Latin America. Sorry. <laughs> Um, historically not Latin America. And then you talk to people like Felipe Nantre, he would say that, yeah, you know, 
why, why does Latin America make sense? You know, this is something that's been imposed upon us from without. You know, it makes sense. South America is a separate space. The Panama, Panama Canal makes a natural break. But uh, whether you agree or not, what, what this proceeded to do was start talking about South America, not Latin America. And it allowed Brazil to sort of say, well, South America can go up to Colombia, which sort of pulls countries which we border everywhere and brings the idea of focusing a little in towards us. So there's the idea. The hook to sell it is uh, was what's called the uh, IRSA, which has been gone through many different iterations and is now essentially formed the, the core of uh, UNASUR, or UNASUR. And the idea is it's, it was called the uh, in English something along the lines of the uh, Regional Initiative for Physical Infrastructure and Integration. And uh, you know if you got the whole the old model of poles of economic growth, they went to the Avanza Brazil model, which was axes. So. Find population centers, market centers, areas that should be interacting with each other, and then ensure or plan to build transportation, information, communications, technologies, and energy linkages, corridors between these centers. So why do we not have regional integration in South America, effective economic integration? You can't get product from one city to another. If you want to get a refrigerator made in Manaus to Quito, you have to go through the Panama Canal. There's no quick overland link. Um, there just physically doesn't exist. It's not as bad as it was, but there isn't the infrastructure to link these places. So he sold this idea in 2000 that you know we should. This is what we should do: build the conditions to allow business to prosper, to allow our societies to interact, to prosper. On top of this, uh, he built on what Colora had done, and he pushed a very strong model of economic uh, outwardization, I guess, of getting the business actors to begin to look outside Brazil. Mercosur was critical for this. Mercosur is kind of the incubator where the business can use Mercosur to experience competition, to figure out how to do it, and then to look out beyond. Um, you find under Cardoso, you start to find uh, shifts in trade patterns, massive changes in who's trading what with whom, and the nature of the product trade is what's really important. Uh, on the whole, Latin America sells um, raw materials or commodities to other countries outside the continent. On the whole, Latin American countries sell value-added products to Brazil. Hugely important. You can only employ so many people in a mine. You can employ far more people stitching together clothes, making shoes, or, or engine parts. So the idea that we need to create these internal linkages. So Brazil would start to encourage uh, imports. Uh, this program that came in at the end called the Competitive Import Substitution Program, which involves uh, the Brazilian Trade Ministry going out finding firms in other South American countries that produce something that's being bought by Brazilians and doing the introductions. And at that point, they step back and let them figure it out. You also had a changing role in the National Bank for Economic, uh, Economic and Social Development, the Bane de Asset, which uh, I don't know if really knows too much about this place, which is a shame, because last year it loaned out over $100 billion. This thing has got money that makes the World Bank cry. Um, Cardoso, under his rule, which was finished off under Lula, they started a change in the, uh, the XM export-import rules that allowed uh, Brazilian firms to use Bayanadeus funding to export engineering services, which means that South American countries could then access affordable financing that they couldn't get from places like the World Bank, the IEDB. You also have shifts, and this is the very important one in the Bayanadeus rules, that allow Brazilian firms to borrow money from the Bayanadeus to make investments in other countries. The Bayanadeus is funded entirely out of the workers' tax. So the rule of the Bayanadeus is any money that comes from this place and spent by this place, invested by it, must be used to create economic activity in Brazil. They managed to work a variance on this, that for a firm to borrow money to invest elsewhere, it needs to demonstrate or provide a plan that will show how we'll create an equal economic growth within Brazil within a set time frame. So if you borrow $400 million to do something somewhere else, how do you create 400 million in economic activity in Brazil within, say, five years? Something like that. Right now, for Cardoso, lots of ideas, pushing lots of things. Security, I'm going to leave aside because well, it's just difficult, and it's not, in traditional terms, a huge problem in South America. Um, we can, you can grill me in that in the question period if you want. Uh, Cardoso, of course, he had major financial problems. The Real Plan was introduced in '95, stabilized the currency. 1999, um, people lose the faith. And the real, real starts to crash heavily. People think this is the end of the world. Uh, very quickly, it stabilizes about 2.7 in the dollar. Um, it dropped down about as low as 3.3. Um, Brazil gets its house in order. Things running reasonably smoothly with a, with a 
a, probably a proper market value for the Real, um, which of course is disastrous for Argentina because Argentina is at this point very dependent on Brazil as an export market for manufacturers. Uh, overnight, Argentine manufacturers went up, tripled in price, effectively, in Brazil. Um, by 2002, this has had an impact. Argentina runs into crisis and collapses economically. So at the end of the Cardoso years, you've got Brazil sitting on the, an economic knife edge. Um, Andre Larazende, who uh, was one of the architects of the Real Plan, gave a very, very chilling uh, presentation in November 2002 in Oxford on where Brazil would go. And basically he said, if Lula deviates from the policies Cardoso's been following, that's the end of Brazil. Game over, finished, completely done. Lula didn't deviate. Lula made, did a very, very clever thing. Um, I think it comes down to sort of his pragmatic character. Lula came into office with a fairly basic goal, um, the way I understand it, which was he wanted every Brazilian to have two meals a day. <coughs> and he would do what he needed to do for this. Um, this posed a bit of a problem, though, because he's coming out of a left-wing political party. Um, and they're not going to be so keen on taking on right-wing um, economic policies as it would be perceived. So this is where foreign policy comes into the question very much so with Lula, is that you have a big change in Brazilian foreign policy under Lula. Uh, Cardoso is very much run along the standard line. He's been pushing things in a new direction, reorienting, but doing everything subsurface, under the radar, doing it quietly with established mechanisms, not really standing up and doing anything particularly abrupt or challenging the system. Largely because he really is a creature of the system himself. I mean, the diplomats, they did have a year to work him over when he was foreign minister, um, so he's uh, very much part of it. Lula, however, brings very, very big change to, uh, or I think substantial change to Brazilian foreign policy, that uh, comes in, in three aspects. The formation of policy, the direction of the policy, and the ambition of the policy. Now, as I said, uh, Put that aside. So the policy formation. So I talked about the importance of Itamaraty as the institutional center for forming Brazilian foreign policy. Um, during Cardoso, we saw the rise of what's called presidential diplomacy. Um, as one of Cardoso's aides described it to me, um, one of the challenges with Celso Laffer when he came in as foreign minister is they had, he had to explain to Laffer that, uh, look, you're an administrator, you're not a policymaker. Cardoso, the president will make the decisions, he will be in the photo, you need to be behind him holding the envelope. Um, it, and this is very much the pattern you see with Felipe, Luis Felipe Labrea, that very capable individual, very good foreign minister, um, but oftentimes following up on things that have been launched by Cardoso, which was a new direction for foreign policy. Uh, Lula, we find the same thing, but what we find behind Lula is very different people. Cardoso's cabinet was people, uh, not cabinet, Cardoso's uh, staff was colonized or peopled by diplomats because he was looking for the best people he could find. He knew them from the foreign ministry and he pulled them in. Uh, not so much with, with Lula. Uh, far fewer diplomats in the, uh, the presidential palace under Lula. What you find instead is uh, the arrival of a new intellectual elite, if you will, a new thinking group. And the Pete has got a workers' party, has a long uh, history of thinking out alternate ways because it's outside of the established system. So it has its own intellectual figures. It has people like Marco Aurelio Garcia, Jose Terceo. Um, and although he's a diplomat and was fairly high up, a Sama Piñera Guimaraes. There's a bit of a tension at the start of Lula, because everybody knew things were going to change. Um, the diplomats actually in the, in the palace were fantastic to talk to during the 2002 election, because they knew the whole thing was changing. Nobody knew what was going to happen. So they talked very freely. It was actually quite refreshing. Um, Rumor had it that uh, Lula wanted to appoint Samuel Piñera Guimaraes as foreign minister. Uh, Guimaraes, uh, arguably quite hard out of the left, um, one of the key things, you can get most of the idea from the title of his book that he made uh, diplomats read for about five years, it's called Quinientos Años de Periferia, 500 Years of the Periphery. Gives you a sense of where he's going. Um, Celso Laffer had had to put uh, Samuel Pinheiro into a kind of internal administrative exile because he was speaking out excessively forcefully against the free trade area of the Americas at exactly the point when the Brazilians, I think, were probably <coughs> busy killing it, but needed to kill it in a way that wouldn't upset the Americans and Canadians. Um, Marco Aurelio Garcia, he's another one of these key figures in here, a uh, long time leftist professor, Cuban trained, spent quite a bit of dictatorship, uh, military years in Cuba. And then you have the third figure who really matters here, and this is the interesting bit, is Cecil Emeline. 
Now, I wouldn't put Celso Amelin out on the left with any of these other people, but I would put Celso Amelin. I think he was labeled by one of the major news, international news publications recently as the world's best diplomat, um, which might not be a stretch. I mean, you definitely, if you're talking about people to model off of, he's definitely someone you'd want to follow on. Incredibly capable, uh, possibly one of the only people in the world who actually understands the WTO and what goes on there. Um, he was ultimately put in the position of foreign minister. Salman Pinheiro was made uh, secretary general, which is the number two of the foreign ministry. Um, he couldn't be made foreign minister because tradition has it either you put a political figure in there, which rarely happens, Cardoso is one of the exceptions, or you have to have been ambassador. And it was a big switch to be able to, it was a big almost sea change to put Salman Pinheiro as secretary general because again, those individuals have almost always been ambassadors, and he had. All right, so what else goes on with this? Um, the idea is the directions that come from. So you've got a couple of figures who remain within the system, but then you've got figures who don't. There's a couple of different advisors floating around in places like the Defense Ministry. They set up a new ministry eventually called the uh, SAI, the Strate uh, Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which is kind of this blue sky thinking place that was run by uh, Roberto Mega, uh, Mega Bera Unger, who was a philosophy prof at Harvard. All sorts of non-diplomatic people untrained people are starting to su suggest to Lula we need to do this, are setting the, the grand path of where things should go. Um, Left-wing thinkers more in line with Simon Pinheiro than with Fernando Hiki are getting put into places like the, the Bene de Esse. Um, one of the executive directors, Dark Costa, has this really rather amazingly interesting book in a sort of backwards way on what should happen in South America, the idea that Brazil should be the leader of South America and it should produce all the manufactured goods and everybody else in the region should supply the, the raw materials. Um, I don't think very many people have read this book and it kind of possibly stopped his rise, but uh, this is the kind of thinking that's coming into the foreign policy process. So that's the left wing end, it's pushed, very much pushing the left wing sort of things I'm going to talk about in a little bit. There's also a right wing push uh, from business that's pushing in. Uh, you have Luis Fernando Ferlan, who I believe was the head of international relations at Fiespe, is appointed the uh, Minister of Development and International Trade, uh, MDG. He, that's also the post that is uh, the ministry that's in charge of the Bain and Ferlan is very interesting because he's been talking about this idea that Brazil should be a massive agriculture exporter. And he's been talking to people in, in Sao Paulo. At the same time that he's doing this, Marcos Yank, who is an agriculture economist via EDB, has realized that, look, we don't know what we're doing in my country comes back to Brazil and he goes to seven producers federations for uh, chicken and corn, sugarcane, green, beef, um, and pork. Goes to these federations and, say, and says straight up, I want you guys to give me a million dollars each. I'm going to set up an independent think tank that's going to crunch the numbers and do the analysis and tell the government how it should set its policy in technocratic terms. The result is ECONE, it's the Institute for International Agricultural Economics. These matter because by 2003, uh, Yank, who's been making all sorts of noise in the op-ed columns, goes quiet, silent, and you have Cancun happen, uh, the Cancun ministerial when G20 trade arises. This happens because all sorts of ideas on how to formulate an agriculture negotiating policy are being pushed into the amount of tea. There's a whole new technocratic uh, legal dimension to trade talks and foreign policies getting pushed in on a commercial basis, not necessarily on the traditional power politics basis. Um, so effectively, industry's not got a voice. Defense starts to push in with national sentiments. It starts to come quietly. Um, by 2008, we've got the Politica de Defensa Nacional, new national defense policy, which is a really fascinating uh, document, uh, just for the way it's printed. On the cover of the document, uh, you have, it looks like a target, but it, that's the wrong way to read it. There's a guy named Gobre Kutu Silva who came up with the uh, geostrategic model of foreign affairs, where everybody's got this, this sphere of influence, these concentric circles. And it's Kudo de Silva's diagram is the watermark that runs all the way through the, di the document. You read the document, and it talks about needing to have unified command and control structures, unified operational structures, interoperable equipment. You're looking at NATO in a South American context on this. Um, of course, who's going to be the center of all this? Brazil, right? They've got the armament factories, they're the one driving the ideas, they'll probably fund it somehow, as long as you buy Brazilian weapons. But again, it's pushing foreign policy in a different direction. Uh, natural resources start to push extremely hard in Ethiopia. about it Why can't we get contracts in Africa? What's going on in Bolivia? 
you know, it's, it's this opening process started under Cardoso, it's now starting to create all of these pressures that are pushing in on the foreign ministry, demanding reaction, demanding new directions. Uh, Congress starts to ask more questions. Foreign policy become, appears in the press, right? It used to be at one point the only place you could find discussion of international issues was on the business pages. It's now in the op-ed columns. It's now to the point in O Estado São Paulo. Probably once a week there's an op-ed or an editorial on foreign policy of some kind. More frequently when you see adventures like what happened with Iran. <clears throat> so all of this boils down to a democratization of foreign policy making in Brazil. Uh, all these new ideas. So these new ideas do not largely come out of the foreign ministry. Um, and they've been pushed onto it from somewhere else. And this is very, very new. And this creates a very new challenge for the foreign ministry. Can you speed up, Dora? Okay. Talk to you. Okay. Um, all right, so on top of this, uh, you've got shifts in the literature. It depends where you are. If you read guys like Rubens Barbosa, Celso Lafra, Rubens Hicupero, Fernando Hic Cardoso, the kind of op-eds they're writing, generally anything you see in Oistado Sao Paulo, which is frankly what I read, but it is kind of on the right, getting extremely shrill as we go up to the presidential vote. Um, they talk about a nonsensical, ridiculous shift to the left. Uh, and, uh, lack of strategic direction when you start to think about the, what's happened with Brazilian foreign policy. Now, Sandro Pinheiro, Marco Aurelio, they have a different worldview than the, the guys who were running the foreign ministry of Brazil. They, they certainly do. You've gone from the center right uh, PSDB to a, a center left, increasingly center uh, workers' party. Of course, you're going to have different ideas coming through, and they've been pushed through. So, what do you have? Well, Marco Aurelio Garcia, uh, Sama Pinheiro Guimarães, I mean, you look at the trajectory of what they've written, what they think, the titles of their papers and their books. They see space for global sol uh, solidarity in the South. This isn't an abstracted idea to them. This is the way forward. This is something they see that will work. And so, you do very quickly see a reorientation of what goes on in Brazil. Um, much more space given for uh, countries like Cuba and Venezuela. The level of criticism, Cardoso would make strong statements about Cuba, to Cuba, to Castro. These things start to disappear. Um, Venezuela, the um, most interesting way I've had this described to me was uh, a couple of years ago by a rather frantic diplomat trying to get a hold of, figure out what was going on. He said, the Americans talk about Venezuela, and they say Hugo Chavez was elected democratically, but he gov governs undemocratically. We dropped the second clause. <laughs> Same, same basic analysis, but they just don't say it. Uh, the attitude with Iran, with the whole nuclear question in Iran, one of the ways I had this uh, that went on in May, the deal the Brazilians brokered with the Turks, the way one person explained it to me was that you have still have a hardcore of the pure ideological left within the PT, within the, close to the president, pushing policy, with the, and what they remember are their brothers in the Iranian Revolution and resistance to the shock from the 70s. They don't see the problems that are going on now, which is why you get this strange shift in approach where Lula, who is a pro-democracy, should be pro-human rights kind of guy, and you, you line up his credentials on human rights and what he's done in terms of international statements against what happened under the Cardoso years, and you get a big disjuncture. Um, the sentence, I've forgotten the woman's name, who was, she was sentenced to stoning to death. Uh, Lula was personally appealed to talk to Medinejad and get the sentence revoked. And the response was, we have to let internal justice procedures in Iran work their own course. That's not the kind of statement you would have looked for from a strong human rights position. But then the view advising Lula is, look, these are our revolutionary brothers. They'll sort it out. It's OK. Deep breath. Uh, Emily came on a little bit later and he said, look, you know, we can't talk. Just because we don't say anything publicly doesn't mean we're not saying something behind closed doors. Um, so I mean. This is one of these things we don't know until we get to see the memos that come out in 30, 40, 50, 60 years, if they ever come out. The big point, though, is that what we do is we see a shiftward leftwards. We see almost an implementation of the Sepalista integration logic. We see a building on the idea of Mercosur. Uh, we see an approach to the South that doesn't see it as a problem, but sees it as an opportunity. And this is the really big change, I think, between uh, the people who are making policy under Cardoso and the people who are making it now. When the Southern Solidarity ideas like uh, the India Brazil South Africa Dialogue Forum, um, Brazil's, uh, Lula's traveling roadshow because he travels a lot, um, the Brazil South American summits, uh, Brazil or South America summit with X, Africa, Sub Saharan Africa, Arab world, Asia, pick group. There's probably been a summit of some kind. These are all designed to build linkages between uh, Brazil and other countries in the South. 
take a look at this in the traditional North Atlantic focused approach to foreign policy and foreign economic policy and this makes absolutely no sense because they don't matter. Sub-Saharan Africa, really, it doesn't matter. How much does South America really matter? You know, the game is played in Western Europe and in North America. They also, the critics also point to the slow results. What are we getting from this? We're not getting a big boost in trade. We're not getting a big boost in bilateral <coughs> people flows. There's no big events happening, no big surges. Yet if you look at the data, you have increasing, you have a, a slow, but accelerating accretion of exchange between Brazil, South Africa, and India. You have much uh, deeper and you know strong ties developing between Brazil and Africa. Uh, you have. It's interesting that the whole discourse around Brazil and its Latin American neighbors, or in South America, has changed over the last four years. Whereas before, people say, "Well, we don't want really Brazilian leadership. You know, we don't trust them. We don't want it to happen." Then all sort of reaction you get from uh, a place like Peru, Bolivia, and Paraguay is like. What do we need to help you invest here? How can we work better together? Yeah, this can go. So the, the shift has happened. It's not uh, a quick and explosive one. So what, what this comes down to is, is a new direction in, uh, in Brazilian form. It's, it's uh, a reorientation of the sense towards the South. And it does, on the surface, make no sense. But then if you stop and you start to look at who in Brazil matters in terms of international relations. Who are the big players? It's Petrobras, Vale, Nobeto Orbrecht, uh, Andrade Gutierrez. These are construction companies and mining companies. Where are they going to make their money? I mean, yes, there's a lot to do in Rio to do with the Olympics and the World Cup. Uh, probably more in Sao Paulo where there's still no stadium. Right? There's, there's a certain amount they can do in South America, but essentially they saturated that market. Um, where are the resources that the mining companies can exploit? They're all in Africa. And one of the things that you find now is the mining companies are fine, and the construction companies are going, at last, you're listening to us. You're opening the space that, so that we can now go and do things. This has been made even easier for Lula by the economic recovery. The surge in commodity prices has greatly eased the process of underwriting this sort of activity. Um, Brazil does development assistance. It's not something that gets advertised. It's not, <coughs> not by any means hit. An ABC, the Agencia Brasileira de Cooperação, which control coordinates this. Um, it's got a web page. It gives you all the information. It's got a beautiful 130-page glossy book of detailing every project they're doing in Africa. But it's not exactly advertised. Officially, the budget's about $20 million. You can't actually find the exact number because it's buried within the foreign ministry, web, uh, foreign ministry budget. Because if it wasn't buried in that, they'd never get it through Congress. The actual spend value is probably closer to, the head of ABC figures it's about $250 million. Um, I've worked in a different development agency, and the stuff they're doing is probably close to 400 to 600 million, uh, because they just coordinate. The ABC sits there and it coordinates a Brazilian agency to go do a project in another country. And you have a different, this goes back to the idea of all of these summits, these slow processes. It's long haul view, and this is another big change you get with Luna. It's not working on a quarterly basis, the normal quarterly business cycle. It's working on a generational. So when Odebrecht goes into a country to do a particular project, um, they may not do the project in the most efficient way as possible. They'll find the way that involves the most people and builds the most relationships possible so that they know they can get the contracts two years, five years, ten years, and twenty years down the line. And they can take the contracts away from the Americans and the Chinese. And this is slowly the pattern that we're starting to see. So all of this... Uh, fits in with sort of Lula's expanded ambition. Um, you know, there's been all sorts of talk, Lula's potential future Secretary General of the United Nations, which I don't think the Americans would ever let happen, and there's that sort of critical job barrier. He doesn't speak English. And that, you know, if you don't speak English, you're not going to get that job. In fact, most of these international jobs he can't have because he doesn't speak English. Um, but you do see Lula sort of embracing this idea of, I am a global leader. I am leading the cell. Um, it's been getting it's almost like he's gone into hyperdrive legacy mode in the last six months. And so this, the, the rational aspects of what I've been mapping out is sort of at, at times have fallen off the rails in the last little while. Um, I think he got a call back in, rain back in a bit in July. Uh, but the abiding reality is that under Lula, they, Brazil's found a way to, to actually absorb some of the costs of leading and to do it publicly, which has actually increasingly led to Brazil being accepted as a leader and seen as a leader. 
which means that it's now when you, know, you sit in the halls of decision making in a country like uh, Canada at least, and I know increasingly in Washington, the panic is that we don't know anything about this country. We don't understand how they work and how they think, and every time we turn around, they're there and they're blocking us. Or they're not blocking us, but they're taking it in a direction where we can't argue with them because of the way they framed it, but it's not necessarily where we want to go. Um, we need to figure it out and understand them. So, I mean, Brazil has emerged. The um, question is, where is it going to go? What's going to happen? So, we have an election in, uh, what, 10 days? Nine days? Yeah, third quarter. So it's a week Sunday, I think. Uh, Dilma's going to win. Dilma Rousseff. Lula said, vote for her. I think that's, that's going to do it. There's all sorts of corruption scandals that are exploding all around her, and she's covered in a nice thick layer of Teflon. So um, unless the miracle happens, and uh, it's not looking likely, um, Seto's going to lose. And it's not to say it's good or bad one way or the other, but uh, she's got 51% of the vote uh, in the polls at the moment, which means she's going to do something Lula never did. If she holds it, she'll win in the first round. Everyone talks about Lula's super majorities, these huge, dramatic victories he had. They all came in the second round. Cardoso won both times in the first round. Dilma may pull it off in the first round. Arguably, it's people voting for Lula again, but that's a different discussion. My point would be, though, even if Seda manages to win, um, I don't think that you're going to see big changes in what's going on with what the, the new trajectory that. Uh, that Lula's launched in foreign policy. You can't rein back these other groups that are trying to push foreign policy. Congress is going to get more and more involved because international things will start to affect the domestic as Brazil internationalizes increasingly. Business community is organized far more than ever used to be and far more capable of inputting. Other government ministries are massively involved now, and this has been encouraged by the sort of programs that, that uh, foreign ministry has been directed to pursue under Lula. Um, and I think just in general, Brazilians are enjoying being internationalized. Um, the southern direction, you'll lose, if Sarah won, you would lose the rhetorical edge. You wouldn't hear the same rhetoric of South South uh, solidarity. You would lose some of the ideological tone. But the reality is, you, you know, the, the, the great, you know, the gray beards behind Seda are sitting in the clubs in Sao Paulo and they're being told, stay the course because we're doing really well out of this. This is good for business by the guys at Fiespe, by the guys at the National Confederation of Industries, by the construction companies and so on. Um, now is this good? Is this bad? Globally? Um, that's kind of why I want to get funded to do some more research to figure that one out. Um, arguably I'd say that this is probably not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think, and this is what I think, that if we take the time to study and to engage Brazil, to look at what Brazil has been up to in the last while, we're going to find a different <coughs> We're still going to find a capitalist model, a predominantly liberal model approach to the world, but we're going to find something a little more interesting. Now, the Pope John Paul talked about the savage face of capitalism when he was in Cuba. I think what we might find is a capitalist face that's not savage coming out of Brazil. So perhaps it's a stretch, but I think we really do need to pay attention to it because uh, Brazil for a number of reasons. One, they are going to be pushing global governance reform very hard, and they're going to keep doing it. Uh, second one, if you're Australian um, and you're worried about the future of your country, they're your competitor. Right? Where do we, where's Australia make its money? Mining? Agriculture. You need to know what Brazil's up to. Uh, particularly a company like Bali and the links, the, the state, uh, the quasi-privatized, privatized state links, but, um, that, that's a whole different discussion and it's very interesting. There's a lot there. It's something that needs to be paid attention to. And the other, the final point, I mean, why does Australia, why do we need to be watching Brazil and paying attention to it? Well, again, Australia is based on agriculture and on mining. There's only so many places on this island that you can dig up minerals. So our mining companies here are going to have to go and find resources elsewhere, place other places where they can do the extractive industries. And the Brazilians are already there. Thank you, Sean. Sure.